Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who just this morning very astutely pointed out that right now at every company in America, the IT guy is more important than the CEO. He is the captain. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am your captain of the Flying Garage ship. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today, I am so happy that we are featuring the very great Sun Drifter by some really good people over at South County Brewing Company. Garage grade four and a half bottle caps out of five. Sun Drifter is a double India Pale Ale, New England style, with an ABV of 8%, and it's loaded with flavor. It's heavy and a little dank like one would expect, but balanced out nicely with notes of white peach, white gummy bear, white wine, and just a little hint of pineapple. And I first want to send out a special thanks to my friend. Cheers to Patrick R. out in Hanover, Pennsylvania. And a big shout out to Megan in Millis, Massachusetts. All right. I'm going to give this one my best shot here, Captain, because we have Camilla from... uh, I can't do it. Somewhere in Sweden. And a big shout out to Maggie in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Next up, we have Jackie and Joe in the UK. And last but certainly not least, we have Nicole in Jacksonville, Florida. Everybody that we mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com and contributed to this week's beer fund. And for that, we give you a big thank you. And if you're on the mailing list, check your email because you have a special promo code that's good for this week only as a thank you for being a part of the True Crime Garage Army. All right, that's enough of the business. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. September 8th, 1983. Dear Parent, This department is conducting a criminal investigation involving child molestation. Ray Bucky, an employee of Virginia McMartin's preschool, was arrested September 7th, 1983 by this department. The following procedure is obviously an unpleasant one, but to protect the rights of your children, as well as the rights of the accused, This inquiry is necessary for a complete investigation. Records indicate that your child has been or is currently a student at the preschool. We are asking your assistance in continuing this investigation. Please question your child to see if he or she has been a witness to any crime or if he or she has been a victim. Our investigation indicates that possible criminal acts include oral sex, fondling of genitals, buttocks or chest area, and sodomy, possibly committed under the pretense of taking the child's temperature. Also, photos may have been taken of children without their clothing. Any information from your child regarding having ever observed Ray Bucky to leave a classroom alone with a child during any nap period, or if they have ever observed Ray Bucky tie up a child, is important. Please complete the enclosed information form and return it to this department in the enclosed stamped return envelope as soon as possible. We will contact you if circumstances dictate same. We ask you to please keep this investigation strictly confidential because of the nature of the charges and the highly emotional effect it will have on our community. Please do not discuss this investigation with anyone outside your immediate family. Do not contact or discuss the investigation with Raymond Bucky, any member of the accused defendant's family, 
or employees connected with the McMartin Preschool. On August 12, 1983, Judy Johnson called police, reporting that her two-year-old son, who was attending the McMartin Preschool, was being molested at the school by 25-year-old Ray Bucky. Ray's mother is Peggy McMartin Bucky, and his grandmother is Virginia McMartin. Ray's grandmother is the founder and owner of the preschool. The Bucky family runs and operates this preschool. The detective that caught the case, she would start her investigation by interviewing a baker's dozen. This included Johnson's son and 12 parents that Johnson passed along their information to the detective. Okay, Captain, so this is serious allegations, obviously, alleged despicable acts committed, and your victim is very young, roughly just two and a half years of age. The boy's mother is making the report to the police, but obviously she was not there when the crimes or alleged crimes were committed. Right. This type of predator is actually more dangerous because if these allegations are true, these individuals are around children all day long. Yes. Many, many potential victims at the ready for this this offender. So the investigation starts off like this. First, the little boy is unable to pick Ray Bucky out of school photos when talking with the police. A medical examination of the boy showed no signs of sexual abuse and really failed to produce any evidence at all regarding sexual abuse, but we all know that there is not always signs nor evidence present. The other parents interviewed, the the first 12, basically all said that they had no reason to suspect that anything nefarious was going on at the school at all. And I'm actually wondering here, Captain, if some of these parents out of this first 12, if they even knew Ray Bucky or probably didn't know Ray Bucky or who he was. Well, this was a prestigious preschool. A lot of these parents wanted their kids to be going there. I don't think it was as easy as just signing up and getting your kid and the McMartin Preschool. Yeah, and a little side note here regarding Judy Johnson's son. She just dropped him off at the school one day. Like, months and months before these allegations ever came out, he he wasn't technically, like, signed up to go to the school. And as you said, you may have had to jump through some hoops to get your child into this school. This is Manhattan Beach. Right, so she just dropped off her kid and they just had to... They didn't even. They didn't know who the kid was. They didn't know who the parent was, why the kid was there. They were all, they were kind of confused, but the McMartins um, are pretty, from, from my understanding, look, you can look at it one way or the other. Either they're despicable, horrible people, or they got into this business because they really do care about children. Well, the mother and the founder of the preschool received a lot of different awards, actually got like woman of the year award Mm -hmm. back in the day for her work at this preschool. So they didn't like kick the kid out. They just accepted him at the school and put him into the system. Right. And once they figured out who the mom was, he just became a student, but his first day at the school, from my understanding, she just dropped him off and didn't speak to anybody. Well, so far, this investigation is not looking so great. We have the boy who cannot pick out the accused from school photos, and we don't have any physical signs of abuse that the medical examiners can find on the boy. So we move on to the next steps, right? We need some evidence. So searches of the school, the grounds, and of the Bucky family home are conducted. During these searches, police collected evidence None of it damning at all. Mostly, this is just typical household items. Of note, we have a rubber duck, a graduation gown, and a few pictures that were cut out of a Playboy magazine. Despite any 
real evidence at all, police did arrest Ray Bucky. This was on September 7th, 1983. But the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office declined to prosecute due to the lack of evidence, and they wanted more. They wanted more evidence collected. And Ray Bucky was released later that same day. So the next day, the Manhattan Beach Police sent the letter that was read by our amazing host during the trailer. This letter went to 200 parents, naming Ray as a child molestation suspect. The letter is asking for the help of the parents of these children to question their kids, find out if the children knew of anything going on at the school, ask them about fondling, about oral sex, about sodomy. The difficult thing here, look, there's many difficult things going on with this situation. The letter doesn't seem like a great strategy, doesn't seem to be well thought out. I get that you are reaching out to a lot of people, to the masses all at once. It seems a little, well, it just seems like a dumb idea to me. But then on top of this, you have untrained parents who are now going to be questioning their children. Some of these kids are very young, like two and a half years old. Mm -hmm. They're asking them about things that they at two and a half, they don't even know about these things. They don't know what this stuff is. Well, and you have to be careful when you're questioning children where you're not leading them or you're right. not giving them the answers. And so, like you said, these parents aren't trained to do so. And it's weird to put out this letter because, again, the initial questioning of the 12 parents, I would say, is enough. Because just because there's maybe some smoke or we have an allegation doesn't mean there's fire and you, you go and raid this individual's home. You find nothing, right? The list of things that they find rubber ducky cap and gown. What does that have to do with anything? Well, the graduation gown will later be later. We're going to be told that that graduation gown was like a, a satanic robe, like a robe that somebody would wear during rituals or, or satanic mass. Uh And, at the end of the day, it's it's just a graduation gown. Like uh, yeah, it's, people it is, have them in their homes. It is worn during a ritual when you graduate from school. Right, right. On October 17th, the L.A. County DA's office asked the Children's Institute International to interview children who attended the McMartin Preschool. It looks like in the end, Captain, that they interviewed about 250 children. The interview techniques used were highly suggestive, and they even encouraged the children to pretend or speculate about supposed events. It was claimed that 360 children had been abused. This is after speaking with the 250. There were examinations, and the children were photographed. Some of them were photographed, and one child in particular and I'm using air quotes here, was photographed by an expert who says that there was some kind of scarring that happened on the child, which she stated was caused by anal penetration. Later, research demonstrated that the methods of questioning used on these children were, as said, extremely suggestive and leading to false accusations, and others believe that the questioning itself may have even led to false memory syndrome. Now I'm a little confused as to why we see a number so high, you know, the, the victim number of potentially 360 when all of the information I could find says they only interviewed about 250 kids. So I, I'm kind of guessing here, captain, that a lot of those 250 would have had to be victims themselves, but may have also witnessed something maybe their stories included witnessing acts on others that were not interviewed right i don't know it it doesn't it doesn't seem to track it doesn't really check out but one thing that's very difficult to get over here is when you're interviewing this many children and it's been said that not one of these children had made any claims of abuse before these interviews. Right. But after the these interviews are conducted, you got hundreds of them saying that they were abused. Well, again, it goes back to who's questioning them and, and what level of 
expertise do they have questioning children? And this is the 80s, and we're going to see an HBO documentary uh, capturing the Freedmen's where they go into depth of how how not to question kids and how you can get kids to say certain things. And, and this will actually be put into practice after the 80s and after this trial, obviously. Well, and one very basic thing of child psychology that, that we know is when a child's being interviewed, especially a very young child, is being questioned by an adult, regardless of who that adult is, most of the time the child will see the adult as some type of authority. And if I were to hold up a stop sign and I'm talking to a little kid, like three-year-old kid, and I say, I point to the stop sign, I say, what color is this? Mm-hmm. And if the child says red and I say, I don't even have to say no. I just say, what color is this? If I say the same sentence again, ask the same question again, the child then assumes that they have given the wrong answer. Right. And so they they want to please the authority. They will search for a new answer. And it's a lot like the Jesse Miss Kelly interview, really. I mean, they just keep asking him the same questions over and over again. He keeps changing his answers until until they move on. And then he's like, oh, cool, I got the right answer. We, we have all these kids now with claims of sexual abuse and, and some even bizarre claims, and we're going to get into some of these. But keep in mind, this all started with only one person coming forward. Only one mother came forward. Well, and you have Bucky working in his family's business, and he looks like a, a mix between, I'd say, Christopher Reeves and Jeffrey Dahmer. If you see his uh, the first trial, he he has those Dahmer glasses on, and so I it's don't like think, a Superman Dahmer baby. Yeah, I don't I don't think that uh, helps him much. Well, in early 1984, social services suspended the school's license, and the school was shut down. About two months later, seven preschool employees, four of which are from the McMartin family. They are indicted on 115 charges of child molestation. All seven of the accused were jailed. All seven pled innocent to all charges. They were charged with sexually abusing 18 children over a 10-year period. Now, in the coming months, the number of victims regarding official charges would grow significantly from 18 to 41 child victims. These 41 young victims will need to testify or issue statements for the preliminary hearings. The first child witness states that he and some of the other students played what he called naked games, and he was touched inappropriately in bad spots by some of the defendants. The other thing that we will start hearing much more about during this time is is that the defendants used death threats to silence the children. On June 6th, this was the start of an 18-month preliminary hearing of the alleged 41 child victims. Only 13 of them would take the stand. But then in a stunning turn of events, the mother who made the first accusations against Ray Bucky, remember this is Judy Johnson, she dies. She was found dead at her home on December 19th, 1985, at the young age of 44. She died from a liver ailment commonly found in alcoholics. Well, it's even more weird than that because she was actually supposed to testify the day that they found her because she actually called the judge and said, "Hey, I don't I don't want to I don't want to testify." Mhm. And they said, well, we, we kind of need you to come in. Uh, it's important for the jury to hear your testimony. And then they find her dead at her house. And there were some people that were suspicious of her death in regards to the charges against this, again, air quotes, child sex ring that thought, oh, it's, it's awfully convenient that she died just before being able to testify. Yeah. So this next part, this is straight from the Wikipedia page on the case because they had this summarized just so perfectly that I wanted to include it. The page says, some of the accusations were described as bizarre. You can say that again, and we're going to get into that. Some of the accusations included satanic ritual abuse. 
So some of the kids said not only were they sexually abused, but they witnessed flying witches. Some of the kids said they traveled in a hot air balloon. Mm -hmm. And some were taken through tunnels that were located beneath the school. In one photo lineup, one child identified actor Chuck Norris as one of the abusers. There were claims that a rabbit, a goat, and a baby were all sacrificed in front of the children. There were claims of orgies at car washes and at airports and of children being flushed down toilets to secret rooms where they would be abused, then cleaned up and presented back to their parents at the end of the school day. Some child interviewees talked of a game called Naked Movie Star, a.k.a. Chuck Norris, and suggested that they were forcibly photographed nude. Judy Johnson, who, as we said, passes away, even her initial allegations were quite bizarre. She came forward because her little boy was having painful bowel movements. So Judy believed that the boy had been abused and sodomized. Her son said that he was not, but her claims and allegations against Ray Bucky not only included fondling, abuse, and sodomy, but she also told police that Ray Bucky had superpowers and that he could fly. Mm, like Clark Kent. Yeah. Right. And again, remember, her son was not able to pick Ray Bucky out from school photos. It it would eventually come out that Judy Johnson was once diagnosed with and hospitalized for acute paranoid schizophrenia. This this is what's really sad here. You know, when we when we review these stories, Captain, there's always like this smaller sad story hidden within these larger stories. The tragic life of Judy Johnson is just is just sad. It it it, it breaks my heart. This to me appears to be a woman that needed a lot of help. And I think that she, she didn't recognize because of things she was suffering from. I don't think she recognized that she needed help mm. and she didn't get it. She didn't get the help that she needed. And I think that that ultimately led to her, her passing away at such a young age. In January of 1986, a judge ordered all seven defendants to a superior court trial on 135 counts of molestation and conspiracy. But very quickly, that would change. Because just eight days later, the DA, the district attorney, said there was insufficient evidence against five of the accused and actually requested a dismissal of charges. Yeah. So the DA was going to move forward against just two of the accused now. The two remaining are Ray Bucky and his mother. So Peggy McMartin Bucky and Ray Bucky remained in custody awaiting trial, facing about 100 counts of molestation and conspiracy. With all of the uncertainty in the world, feeling safe at home has never been more important, which is why I want to talk to you about Simply Safe Home Security. They're longtime friends of our show and for a good reason. Simply Safe has made it easy to finally get comprehensive protection for your home. There is no technician or salesperson that needs to come and disrupt your house. You don't need to pay any outrageous monthly fees or sign a two year contract. Just order online and set it up yourself in under an hour. Your home is protected 24-7 with emergency dispatch for break-ins, fire, and more. All for just 50 cents a day. And we're not the only fans of Simply Safe. U.S. News and World Reports name Simply Safe Best Overall Home Security of 2020. Head to simplysafe.com slash garage and you'll get free shipping and a 60-day money-back guarantee. That's simplysafe.com slash garage to make sure they know our show sent you. From Simply Safe and all of us here, wishing you safety and good health. All right, we're back. Cheers, me mateys. Cheers. All right, so, so far, 
let me see if I'm following this correctly. We have these initial allegations. It's coming from a mother that we we know has some mental issues, definitely has a drinking problem. There's real no proof found. The child can't even pick Ray Bucky out of a lineup. And this would be the person that they're claiming abused him. And then they send out this letter. This letter goes out to hundreds of parents. Like we both said, they're not qualified to question their children. We get crazy claims, these underground tunnels, hot air balloons. And because of these claims and because of these allegations, a lot of them were saying, well, yeah, these other kids were there while this was going on. So therefore, since it can't just be Ray Bucky that's involved, it has to be these other teachers and these other administrators at the preschool have to know what's going on. There's also other claims that they're threatening them with guns. They're killing animals in front of these kids saying, hey, if, if you don't, uh, if you tell on us, then we're going to kill your family. And, and then it becomes this whole, well, this is not only just a sex ring, but this is also a child pornography. They're taking pictures, they're filming things, and it's all satanic. The claims by the children are just bizarre. Now, keep in mind, some of them are very young. Some of them were current students at the preschool. Um, they, but, but it goes to show you that if some of these claims that are so fantastical if they can't, if they are physically not possible, I mean, just science alone tells us some of these things 100% did not happen. You would think that these experts would take this a little step further and say, well, our technique that we're using to question these kids is coming up with some, some pretty weird stuff here. Maybe it's all weird stuff. Maybe it's all made up. We, we have... And then you have the the son, Judy Johnson's son. Not only we're not even talking about a photo lineup that he couldn't pick Ro, Ray Bucky out of. He couldn't pick Ray Bucky out of school photos. They were showing the child school photos, and like just some of these claims. The initial claim, like we said, Judy Johnson's claim that Ray Bucky could fly. We know Ray Bucky cannot fly, and one of the students said that about the orgies at the, they were having orgies with the, with the, these adults at car washes and airports, yet there's no witnesses to any of this stuff. One of the kids says that they flew him and several other kids flew with the owner from California to Florida on a plane that had no windows that it left from the airport. And then at the end of the day, he and the kids were there when their parents came to pick them up. It's four and a half to five hours just to fly one way, California to Florida. Right. And then to fly back, it's impossible that, that the child would be there. I mean, there was mention of a devil house where lions lived. We also have situations where some of these kids are saying things like an elephant was killed at the school in front of children, that Ray Bucky held up rabbits and cut off their ears and told them that if they told their parents, that's what he would do to their parents. Yeah. And they, they did a search of the school to see if there would, you know, digging stuff up to see if there was remains of animals found, which correct that there were none. There was some claims where some of the kids talked about being taken off of the school and going to houses. The weird thing is some of those houses actually existed, mm -hmm. but Again, how are they questioned? And then one of the main reporters at the time that kept reporting about this on air, which that's another thing. We have all these claims, and because it made good TV, they'd make all these claims public. And then you have Key McFarlane, which was this a social worker that would interview the children using puppets. And they had tons of footage of this. And everybody thought this was the nail in the coffin. This is the smoking gun. And the defense attorneys said, okay, we want to see it. And the prosecution did not want them to see this. And from 
defense attorney's mouth, which obviously they, they have an agenda, but they say you can watch these films and you can watch uh, these interviews and it proves that nothing happened. Right. Right. It's like a smoking gun in the other way. Well, eventually, Captain, Peggy McMartin was released, this on $295,000 bail, but Ray Bucky was denied bail. Remember, this whole thing started back in 1983. In our timeline now, we are at January of 1986, but it won't be until April 20th of 1987 that the court begins jury selection. So you have the right to a speedy trial, but you just might not get one. What you see here is a process that drags on and on, and the longer it goes, the more the case just keeps falling apart, right? We see the reduction in victims. Then we see the reduction of charges and perpetrators. By October of 1988, now five years into this process, we are down to just two accused, and now there are just 65 charges left and only 11 victims. What I think you have here, Captain, is what you were getting at with those videotapes. I think when the prosecutors are looking at these videotapes and watching them, they're going, well, we can't put this kid on the stand. He's, he's making claims that are scientifically incorrect that cannot happen. Right. They are picking and choosing which victims to believe. Right. But <laughs> this is, this is where it gets tough for me because the initial investigation, I think at that point you go, well, there's some claims we're going to keep an eye on it. But for some reason, they were dead set on bringing down Bucky and his family. That's mm-hmm. where the letter came out. And that, and again, before you even go to trial, before you charge anybody, take these hundreds of claims. And like you said, if somebody's saying, well, we went down the yellow brick road and ran into the scarecrow and the, the lion and the tin man, that maybe that didn't happen and we should push that one aside Mm -hmm. and ones that are credible or we can back up with some kind of evidence. Now we push that in the pile of that possibly could have happened. And so again, you want to ruin these individuals lives by making these claims against teachers that worked in this preschool. Could you imagine being a teacher and you've done nothing but try to help kids and and nurture kids and you're in this profession because you love kids and now you're being accused of satanic uh worships and satanic sacrifice in the in the sense of molesting these kids and you're lumped into this pile with zero evidence zero eyewitnesses some of the like you said some of the accusers can't even name who attacked them. Mm -hmm. And so there's so much stuff that I think could have been done initially. And Mm -hmm. also this became, this became a story. Like you said, the first accusations, 1983, we're, we're already three, four years into this thing. These news stations are reporting on this almost daily. Oh, the media loved this story because they loved the, the fantastical accusations, how bizarre these accusations were. They loved it. And the, really the, these seven people, especially the McMartin family, they were really being tried in the court of public opinion by the media. Right. What they did was, you know, we have these preliminary hearings going on. They didn't allow any cameras in the courtroom because we had children who were taking the stand child victims. Right. They didn't know, the media does not know the name of the child, but they can hear. They're listening in on closed circuit TV, and then they're running to the the press. They're running to the camera with each one of these crazy, fantastical accusations. And like I said, Kim McFarlane, which is a social worker, but she was dating an on-air personality. Right. That's a conflict. Who was covering the trial. Right. That's a conflict of interest. Right there, and I try to take a step back and think, if I'm a detective and I hear these claims, the initial claim, 
well, I want to get this bastard, right? Mm-hmm. I want to get. The, I don't want anybody to hurt any child. I don't want anybody to rape a child and to have them be messed up for the rest of their lives. And like we've seen time and time again, kids that are abused be, can become abusers, right? It's a cycle, a cycle of abuse. Right, and it's not a, a, I think way back in the day, I said it was a high percentage. It's not a high percentage. It's not a high percentage that you'd be abused and then you become an abuser. But it's enough that it's, like you said, it creates this vicious cycle. So this is something as a detective, as a parent, as as anybody that you would go, we need to stop this. We need to get to the bottom of this. But once you keep running into brick walls and just like the tunnels, I mean, you start digging up, you start trying to find before they dug up anything, the rooms that these kids kept on claiming, oh, that's the room. And we went into a tunnel. Well, there are initial checks that they could do to find out there's no tunnel here. Right. So at, at some point, these claims that you are giving some credence to once you realize that it's false and, and it's okay. And you can go, okay, well we messed up because we questioned these kids wrong, but you know what? These kids will forget about that. They'll, the kids will forget about making false claims pretty quickly once this all goes away. But in the process, you ruin the school that everybody said was a prestigious preschool to go to winning awards protecting children, safe environment, and because some initial claims, and you didn't even do a background check on the people that are making the claims, you ruined so many people's lives. Yeah, I mean, the, they shut down the McMartin's family business, and the McMartin family lost everything during the course of all this thing. They spent all their money on their defense. In February of 1989, Ray Bucky is finally released from jail, this on one and a half million dollars bond. And after he has been in jail for about five years, he's been in jail for five years. Yes, he's being charged with something, but can you think of, can you imagine being in jail for five years and you've actually not been convicted of anything yet? You're, you're still in the trial process. Right. Well, but that, look. It's supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. So if he's innocent until proven guilty, he should be out. Uh, yeah, they waived for no no release for Bucky because of the supposed death threats against possible witnesses. Right. But see, here, here we are, 1989. Once again, all the charges are again reduced, this time down to 52 counts. So you can even see the prosecution isn't very happy with their case. Because this thing just keeps getting reduced and reduced and reduced. During the trial, both the defendants did take the stand. This is pretty much the two biggest parts or or highlights, if you will, of the trial. A lot of times defendants don't take the stand. So this this was of interest to the media. And both of them in what is a trial that that truly all of America is watching, both defendants, of course, strongly denied ever abusing any students or any child ever at all right during the trial some of the children's testimony stated that the naked movie star game was actually a rhyming taunt used to tease other children this was something that the kids made up and then it turned into this whole weird sex ring thing they're saying the kids said this rhyming taunt went like this what you say is what you are you're a naked movie star you know how kids come up with dumb Mm. little rhymes to say. And so this had actually nothing to do with, with anything, having naked pictures taken of, of the kids at all. One of the big things in this, in this trial is when they had, they had three doctors that were taking evidence, you know, they were, they're examining these kids. They're taking photos they're documenting everything because they wanted to be able to say, look, these are the claims I'm making, and these are the reasons I'm making these claims. And a lot of them talked about, well, because of this abuse that you can see on the genitals and on different areas that you could see scars or scar tissue. And and they had all three, which was a great move by the defense team, 
separately, they said, okay, can you point out the area? And they had all three experts and all three of them pointed out different areas. Yeah. So none of them matched at all. When I initially heard some of these claims, uh, the parents questioning, we know that that's probably not right. We know they're not qualified to question their, their kids. But once these kids are medically examined, then I put a little more weight into that because we have medical examiners saying, hey, look, there's some signs. There's not 100% proof evidence, but, but there are definitely some signs. And so I put some weight into that. On November 2nd, 1989, the jurors began deliberations for what would be three months and 16 days later that the jury ended their long deciding period and the long awaited verdict was in. The jury acquitted both Peggy McMartin and Ray Bucky of all 52 counts. Yeah. But we are not done yet because some of the jurors at a press conference following the trial stated that they believed the children had in fact been molested, but the evidence did not allow them to state who had committed the abuse beyond a reasonable doubt. And much of the media seemed to be convinced that Ray Bucky was guilty as well. Well, and, and, and hold on that that's going back to what I was saying about the medical examiners. When you have a doctor forget all this hocus pocus bullshit in these tunnels and these naked movie star games and all that stuff. When you have a doctor telling you that there's some evidence there, it's like, okay, well, again, what the jury is saying is, well, there's some evidence there. We just don't know who did it. Yeah. And well, you also had one of your least favorite things in this case, a jailhouse snitch mm. who comes for you. I know how much you love a, a good old jailhouse snitch. They should be, they should not be legal. Yeah. He comes forward and says, you know, in jail, Ray told me, he confessed to me that he did abuse some of these these children. Yeah, did you know how long this individual was in the cell with Ray? I know I don't know much about it because I didn't look into that angle because it was discredited. Yeah, so well what here's here's the story. So at the time California was getting in big trouble because they were taking individuals that they weren't able to get anything out of. And they were taking known jailhouse snitches and putting them in there and then obviously having them snitch right. on trial. So what they do is they put this individual in the cell less than 48 hours. So you're having a guy that's claiming for years, I'm innocent, not telling the authorities anything, not cracking at all, but somehow they put this guy in they put him in the cell with him under 48 hours, full confession. Singing like a bird. Well, here's what's so funny. The guy shows up. He's he's on stand one time, one day. He has to come back the next day, mm -hmm. but he, ne he never showed up. So they arrested him. So the first day, they got this jailhouse snitch, and they got him all dressed up, and they got him in a suit. And they got him playing the game, right? Combed hair and everything. Doesn't show up the next day. And they find him. They have to arrest him. So now it's the second day of him talking about how he got a confession out of Ray. And he doesn't have a suit on. And he's right. covered in tattoos. And he his hair's not done. And by the way, there's two sheriffs on each side of him as he's testifying. Yeah. Now, it didn't go well for the prosecution, but these jailhouse snitches, is, it's stupid. There's so many of them that have been false that it's like they should just be, it should be illegal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the thing here, though, Captain, we have Ray Bucky, who is actually going to be retried later, this time on just six counts. But this trial resulted in a hung jury. The prosecution. But hold on. This is two years, roughly two years after the the first trial. 
What I have here is that the second trial lasted from May 7th, 1990 to July 27th, 1990. Yeah. This resulted in a hung jury. The prosecution then gave up trying to obtain any type of conviction in the case. The case was closed with all charges against Ray Bucky dismissed. In the end, Ray Bucky was jailed for five years without ever being convicted of committing any crime at all. Yeah, there should be a lawsuit there. In the end, too, the trial lasted seven years and cost $15 million. At the time, it was, and this still may be the case today, it was the longest and most expensive criminal case in the history of the United States legal system. And as said, it was a trial that ultimately resulted in a grand total of zero convictions. Yeah. And, and we said the McMartin preschool was closed, but the building itself was actually dismantled. And guess what? There were no tunnels under the school. The secret tunnels under the school were much of the alleged abuse supposedly took place. They didn't even exist. Well, they did bring in an archaeologist to do some digs. Indiana Jones. And uh, he, he claims he found tunnels. But a bunch of the reporters that followed him, his investigation was, yeah, he found tunnels once he dug the tunnels. Right. So um, they found like building material down there, but it was determined that it's believed that that building material was pretty much just trash from where they constructed the school itself. Well, he also claimed that he found a plate that had a pentagram on it. Again, I, that could have been placed there. Think about it this way. If you're some teenager that lived in the area and you know what they're looking for and you jump the fence one day and and put a pentagram on something. Right. Uh, and I'm I'm not trying to make excuses. It's just I, I don't buy any of that stuff. I don't look. Well, you're you're spot on because there were people that were like spray painting graffiti on the school and on the grounds yeah. after these charges were brought forward. No, and my thing is these tunnels, for example, forget the hot air balloon, forget all that stuff. When these kids talk about these tunnels or these secret rooms, don't you think the police and the detectives and the, the prosecutors want to find that? Right. And they would have found that if there was a tunnel, just a simple tunnel. They would have found that. And to me, you find that, well, there's your smoking gun. Because... For a kid to say, oh, yeah, we were we were molested in this tunnel and we're put in this secret room. If you find that secret room in that tunnel and you have hundreds of parents that let their kids go there that never heard about this room or the secret spot, uh, to me, that's would be a smoking gun. But th th this this whole scenario is strange because, you know, we have to take allegations of sexual assault, rape, anything like that, we have to take it very serious. Yes. And so on some level I go, I can't fault these detectives because they wanted to find something, but they did it in such a way that I think you would have found anything. If if well, you if they would have questioned, if they would have sent out a note to two hundred and some uh parents and said, look, there, there was a murder that took place, and we're trying to see if any of your kids saw it. I think we'd get back a percentage of kids that were like, oh, yeah, I saw Ray murder somebody. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I think you would have gotten that back anyways because the age of the kid. You're talking about an age range of three to five, six. Uh, this is prime time for for kids to make up stories. Mm -hmm. I know that one of the doctors that they've used the way that she has documented cases and child abuse, that that has become, she's really helped create some of the standards on how we document this stuff. So I'm not saying that she was right, but if she was so wrong, why would we adapt uh, anything that she did in this trial that we didn't get a convi conviction to modern day practice. And See, I, and I'm I, on, I'm unclear on that. Cause I thought it was, this was examined in 
and it was decided to change the way that we do it, not because this worked well, but because it went so badly. Uh, I'm I'm not certain. You you could be spot on with that. I I don't know the details. Here's my thing: is like again, I I don't want to fault detectives or police or the prosecution for wanting to get a child molester. That is the scum of the earth. I want them all to die, all to burn in hell, right? But when you have a physician saying they examine these patients. And maybe they're wrong on a percentage of the patients. How could you explain all the the abuse marks or the scar tissues or whatever these medical professionals are saying? And I understand that it's it was early in the study of all this, but is it possible that there was was some things that were going on? Well, and, that's, and maybe not in the preschool, but maybe at somebody's house. That's or, what I'm saying. That's what that's where you take the jurors' words, where the one juror said, "Hey, it's it's my opinion that maybe one or two of these kids were in fact molested, but the evidence doesn't tell us who who was the perpetrator of that right. beyond a reasonable doubt." So, as you said, it could have been. You could have a child who was abused just by somebody else that has nothing to do with the school at all. In fact, and I didn't want to get into this because I don't know how true it is. One of the accusers later, the the mother changed the story of the abuser was her boyfriend and right. not somebody at the school. And I don't want to get into that too much because I don't know if that resulted in a conviction or what. But you go back to the initial allegations and you did have some good people along the way. And, and here's, here's the thing that I want to point out. I do believe that a lot of these people who were ultimately wrong and had bad judgment, that being the, a lot of the district attorney's office and a lot of the detectives and the judge and so on and so forth. I do believe that a lot of them thought they were doing good work, that they were helping a bad situation. I right. think their intentions were good. When you had 13 kids take the stand, right? There, Yeah, and there were some real heroes along the way. I mean, you have a judge who is saying, hey, let's reduce these charges because this this case is getting weird. It doesn't make, it's not making sense. You do have a prosecution team who is reducing charges, who are letting accused go. They, they're dropping charges against, it. we went from seven accused down to two. Right. And we did have, you know, a detective that came out and told the prosecuting team, the DA's office says, before you bring any official charges, you need to take a look at this and you need to take a look at that because it, this stuff is starting to not check out. And what I mean by that is the first allegations altogether right. of Judy Johnson contacting the police and saying, hey, my son is having some painful bowel movements. Therefore, he was sodomized. Well, when you dig a little deeper, you figure out that she not only accused Ray Bucky, 25-year-old Ray Bucky of the preschool of as being one of the abusers, but she also accused her estranged husband as having sexually abused the boy. Right. Initially, the boy says there was never any sexual abuse at all. This is the same woman that would go on to tell the detectives that she saw Ray Bucky flying and that her ex-husband also raped a dog. Mm. This, this poor woman was mentally ill and needed a lot of help. And she was very paranoid. And I think she, I think she was afraid of things that weren't actually happening. But, well, back to the point of the 13 kids that testified. Some of those have came forward now and said, hey, I don't think any of that stuff happened that I testified to. Yeah, I saw at least two of them that as adults came forward and said, I made the whole thing up because of the direction of the doctors and my parents. Right. But we have other victims that have stated that, no, what I said then was true and and I, I still stand by that. And that's where you wonder if we have that false memory syndrome that we were talking about earlier. As quoted in the San Francisco Examiner, who 
like several other publications had some great coverage on the case. And the examiner was much less biased than most of the papers at the time. But the quotes that I wanted to read are first from the first one is from Peggy McMartin Bucky, one of the accused. She said, I've gone through hell and now we've lost everything. And that couldn't be more, that statement could not be more true. One of the jurors was quoted as saying, I believe the children believed what they were saying was true. I could not tell if the children were telling what actually happened to them or if they were repeating what their parents told them. And we talked a bit about the bias of the media. Well, the LA Times in a, in a 1990 article by David Shaw, who was a Pulitzer Prize winning media critic for the LA Times, whose deeply reported series were often tough on his own newspaper. But in regards to the media's coverage of the McMartin trials, he posed a very simple question. Where was the skepticism in the media? Citing pack journalism and hysteria that marked the early coverage of the McMartin case. From the article, which is just a fantastic read, anyone can find it, just Google McMartin trial LA Times. Shaw wrote, media feeding frenzies have become almost commonplace in recent years. But in McMartin, the media seemed especially zealous, in part, in large part, because of the monstrous, bizarre, and seemingly incredible nature of the original accusations. More than most big stories, McMartin at times exposed basic flaws in the way the contemporary news organizations functioned. Pack journalism, laziness, superficiality, cozy relationships with prosecutors, a competitive zeal that sends reporters off in a frantic search to be the first with the latest shocking allegation. Responsible journalism be damned. A tradition that often discourages reporters from raising key questions if they aren't first brought up by the principals in the story. Now, Captain, I watched, I had to rewatch it because I actually watched it when I was much younger, was the HBO movie Indictment, the McMartin Trial. With James Wood. The great James Woods. So this came out in 1995, and it also has one of my favorites. Oliver Stone was one of the producers. And Indictment actually won a couple of awards. It won two primetime Emmys and two Golden Globes. And according to Wikipedia, the film is cited as a watershed in the shift of ideas about satanic ritual abuse, recasting Ray Bucky as a victim of hysterical conspiracy rather than a child abuser. Well, again, this case, to me, it still leaves questions. As much as we go, a lot of these claims were you know, claims of fantasy, really, and hot air balloons and secret tunnels and, and these devil-worshipping games. I, I do not want to dismiss, or especially the 13 victims that testified, and then the victims that still claim this abuse happened to them. I don't want to dismiss that. But it's it's one of those cases where it's like you can't believe it on either end. Like, okay, we get this initial claim and then we send out letters to hundreds of people. What do you think you're going to get back? At the end of the day, you have this good school that was closed. You have teachers that their career was ruined. You have kids that possibly have false memories a whole family that went bankrupt childhoods ruined ray bucky who spends over five years in jail five years of his life taken well, no, away from him. His, his life was gone after this there is no going back right you know he had to leave change his name he got married has a son i just want to leave you with this one thing and I believe this was in the second trial. I just want to leave you with this one thing. Because there's so many questions here. The first question that was asked by the prosecution to Ray when he was on stand in the second trial was, why do you like kids so much? And his reply was, because they're honest.
With all the uncertainty in the world, now is the time to protect your home with Simply Safe. There's no technician, no salesperson that needs to come to your home. Just order online and set it up yourself. You don't need to pay any outrageous monthly fees or sign up for a two year contract. Your home is protected 24 7 with emergency dispatch, all for just 50 cents a day. Head to simplysafe.com slash garage and get free shipping and a 60-day money-back guarantee at simplysafe.com slash garage. Protect you, protect your family at simplysafe.com slash garage. And here's a little recommended reading. This week we are recommending Star Spangled Scandal, Sex Murder and the Trial that Changed America. One day, an anonymous note sets into motion a tragic course of events that culminates in a shocking murder. This true story sparked a national debate on madness, honor, virtue, fidelity, and the rule of law. Check out Star Spangled Scandal. And as always, for everything true crime, check out truecrimegarage.com. Yeah, and we know everybody's world is upside down, so we want to thank you for joining us again in the garage. And until next week, be good, be kind, and don't listen.